what God is trying to show is that human ingenuity, human ability is never going to fully cut it. And so when you read the book, you know, when you read uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of years of history in the book of Kings and you see king after king after king after king coming and king after king failing, people who've had great education, people who've had everything given to them, like Solomon, and yet they fail. And, and so God is showing there that, you know, by man's ability, man will not build a kingdom. And until the Messiah comes, until he comes, with a new kingdom, and there will be an everlasting kingdom. That's the only time that 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 there will be a proper society where where everything will be okay. So you, the utopia that man can build will never be able to be built. Be built. And so, for example, interesting at the, at the turn of the nineteenth, at the end of the nineteenth century, into the going into the twentieth century, the mantra was: we will build a, a new Jerusalem. We will build a perfect world and then we had the f first world war then we had the second world war and the utopian dreams of humanity were smashed the third thing I want to say is Christianity uh, has two two things it talks about the state Jesus says render unto Caesar what is Caesar so the state has has a role in restraining sin the state has a, a role to, to do that but then Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And what that means is you're born from above. The Holy Spirit comes and dwells in your heart. So the way for society to change is not just the political outward stuff. There is this renewal with inside. And, and Christianity, you know, in the Roman Empire when Christianity came on the scene, it was decaying. And Christianity brought a renewal from within from within within humanity, get, giving a, a regeneration of the heart to human beings, and lifted humanity out of the degradation of, of a collapsing Roman Empire. So what I would say is that three things. Number one, God was already planning the Messiah to come, showing that polit politics will fail. Number two, um, that man's utopia would have been shown to fail, and number three, that God's answer ultimately is to renew human beings through being born again. Politics is important and valuable, but it's never going to fully solve the issue unless people's hearts are changed, and we're not going to see a change. Okay. Um, you know, the, the I, I can I can understand what you're saying, but the. You know, the system of the judges was was the system that was put in place um, by by Moses and and ostensibly by Yahweh Himself. Um, so, to me, if if that was the the best, the ideal situation, um, we should see even uh, you know secular societies kind of going. Toward that, just for the fact of you know, uh, empirically that that would be the better system, but you know we we don't see that. I mean, we see judges in place, but the judges are are held accountable. They're not you know in a lot of cases they're not appointed for life and things. They they're uh, in some cases elected, in other cases they're they're appointed, but they can be pulled out and um, they don't have a final word. There's a there's a Process for appeals and things like that. Um, all of these things that that we have in in modern Western societies and things, I think, are are better than what was put in place, you know, originally uh, in the Old Testament. Um, and I'm just left with question mark saying, well, why wouldn't this other system that's different, that was supposedly given by a, an all-knowing being? be superior to what we've kind of come up with on our own. Okay, Run. But what what's interesting here uh, in this conversation, Run, is all the conversation is is principally not all of it, but most of it is about the Old Testament. And you know, I think you're making a big mistake when you're saying that when you're trying to say, well, what we have now uh, is better than the Old Testament because 
Christianity is based on the Old Testament, but we are we are in the New Covenant now, not the Old Covenant. In Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah talks about a New Covenant, and so the Old Testament is valuable and has many lessons for us to learn. Uh, for example, the Ten Commandments are, are for all for, for, for all time. But there are many things in the Old Testament, like there are priests. Uh, there were high. There was a high priest in the Old Testament. Uh, Jesus is the final high priest. Uh, Moses was not only a leader; he was a prophet. Jesus is the final prophet. So many of the things of the Old Testament are fulfilled in Christ. Uh, and in Christ, we should be thinking about. You know, when when you make the argument, if you made the argument run, what we have now is better than Jesus Christ, then that would against Christianity but when you're saying what we have now is better than the Old Testament then it to, to be honest you misrepresent in Christianity it, Christianity is not Judaism Ju Christianity is based in Judaism is part of Judaism uh, Jesus is a Jew but it's not rooted solely in the Old Testament it's rooted in the Old Testament but it's also rooted and founded on on Jesus Christ and the New Testament and I think you're making a category category mistake there bro well but I'm not I'm not saying even the religion I'm just saying uh, look here was an opportunity for uh, a deity to kind of show off in a way that wasn't massacring people that wasn't <laughs> um, you know, doing something kind of horrific, which a lot of a lot of the Old Testament does. But this is a way that he could show, okay, this is something, uh, an innovative government uh, and and legal system that was more just than the surrounding uh, cultures. Um, that was innovative in that it put in place um, checks and balances and, and made leadership accountable uh, because we, we recognize that humans are corruptible and, and, and corrupt, corrupted when they are put in power. Um, you know, but, but we don't see that. You know, we, we see a system of judges that weren't, didn't have that kind of accountability. Um, and then we see a system of kings that replaced that because that wasn't working and the people were complaining um, and then the kings were corrupt and things so it's it's a, the, the initial failed system that was you know s similar to you know some of the situations um, and surrounding nations and things uh, and it didn't seem I, I don't see any reason to believe that it was so innovative or insightful into human nature that that it had to have come from uh, a deity. I think, to me, it makes more sense to look at it and say, "This is the work of of human hands and human thinking that's representative of the time where they lived and the place where they lived." Okay. Well, a couple of things. Well, you say it'd be a great opportunity for a, a deity to show uh, his glory or, or his splendor or whatever. Well. The, one of the things in, in Leviticus and in Deut Deuteronomy, I mean, a couple of things. Number one is the Ten Commandments. Um, that was that was something that God wanted the Jewish, the, the people of God to focus on. And in summed up as love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So God reminded human beings that Ba that's the basics. I mean, even Solon, who was uh, a Greek uh, philosopher and political thinker, who uh, some atheist scholars in the past have pointed to as a, a paragon of virtue, and and um, who who stated the golden rule, uh, was actually a person who, behind the political scenes, uh, was getting people assassinated and stuff like that. But the the point is that you know Solon. Solon uh, saw the need for the golden rule even though he didn't actually practice it. The point one I'm trying to get at is the Ten Commandments is always going to be relevant. The idea of loving your neighbor as yourself, even you, you and I both, I'm sure, would agree to that st standard. The second thing I want to say is, um, you know, one of the things about 
the Old Testament is the is the high priesthood and the Day of Atonement. You know, once a year they had the Day of Atonement, and there they would sacrifice the lambs and they would sacrifice uh, the animals, and Israel's sin was put on the animals, and they would have an escape go. And in in the midst of that, there were stories like where uh, Moses lift up the staff, and anybody who looked at the staff wouldn't be bitten by the serpent. Uh, in the book of Genesis, you have stories where uh, Jesus, uh, where uh, Abraham uh, was told to sacrifice his son, and uh, and then told not to, and then given a ram. Now the ram uh, to be sacrificed uh, by Abraham, uh, it, Moses holding up the staff, the high priest sacrificing the animals. All these are pointing to the final sacrifice. God is saying, look, you've got all these ideas about how to solve society, politics, and, and all the rest of it. But you know the deepest problem with you human beings is your heart, that your heart's not right. And until your heart's right with me, you're not going to get anywhere. And that is the splendor of God, that he, right at the beginning in the time of Israel, was pointing to... Jesus and Jesus would come and be the final sacrifice for our sin. So the answer to your problem and my problem politically is my heart and your heart. And all, like I said, all like you said about these failed systems. Uh, well, you know, again, you you you're making a, the mistake of misunderstanding what the Old Testament is about. It's part of a progressive revelation. It was never meant to be a perfect model. It was a shadow of things to come in. Um, run, please get if you get a chance, just read the book of Hebrews, and I, and and it, and it talks about the Old Testament is a shadow. It's pointing to eternal things, spiritual things. So sac everything that you know, the high priest when the high priest in the Old Testament when he was sacrificing, he had garments on. If you do a study of those garments, every one of them was symbolic. Of, it, of eternal spiritual things. If you go in, if you do a study of the tabernacle in the time of Moses and what was in the tabernacle and why it was there, they were all symbols of the heavenlies. And so, if you read the book of Hebrews, you'll get an understanding of that. That you know they were not meant to be perfect models uh, in the Old Testament. They were meant to be uh, shadows of eternity, uh, pointing to eternity. And if you read the book of Hebrews, you get that. The, the other thing as well, there are lots of different lessons that you can learn. For example, a president or a prime minister about if they studied the life of David or the life of Moses about leadership. For example, Moses killed someone and took things into his own hands and uh, went into the desert and had to learn humility. And if you're going to be a leader, you've got to have humility. You can learn lots of great lessons in modern times from these uh, great leaders of the past. Yeah. Well, and so one of the things that I've uh, kind of spoken on and, and, and written about in my blog and on, in my, on my channel um, are the stories of, of David and then the story of Achan from is it in jo it's in the book of Joshua. Uh, you're familiar with Achan, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he's he's stoned to death uh, along with all of his family uh, because he stole from one of their defeated enemies, and um, and and that was allowed sometimes and not allowed other times. Uh, and <clears throat> and so this man and his whole family were stoned to death. Um, whereas David, um, who did several things that were universally wrong, not not okay in some situations and not you know uh, disallowed in other situations, but he he committed adultery, um, he you know conspired and committed murder and and tried to deceive, um, you know all of these things that you know were very serious issues. Um, he was not stoned to death. His family was not stoned to death. He didn't even lose power. Um, and when you know, when I, I actually was still kind of struggling and on the fence about my faith and things. Um, I sat in a Sunday school class, uh, you know, in an adult Bible study where they looked at both of those stories side by side, and I thought, 
um, you know, both of these judgments allegedly were, you know, handed down from from Yahweh himself uh, through the prophet um, Nathan in one case and through the leader Joshua in the other case. Um, so if it's the same being that is uh, kind of distributing justice in, in both of these situations, um, and on the one hand, there's a peon, a nobody, um, who by all purposes, you know, uh, you know, if you if you actually read the story, it seems very much like he is the scapegoat for a really bad military uh, decision that was made by by Joshua, and and poor Achan and his family get the brunt of the you know the, the bad end of the stick on it. Um, and then David, who is in power, um, is you know has done something really bad w much worse than what Aiken did yeah. uh, as far as you know lives lost and um, you know all of these things um, and yet and yet he he's, he stays in power and I, I I thought to myself if if this was a modern situation where the leader got away with this um, and and another guy who was just a peon was, you know, brutally killed like this for a crime that was, you know, and, and he was, a, you know, by all accounts, just a soldier in the army. Um, you know, if, if that happened today, we would be outraged okay. because it's, it's not just because it's, it's so incommensurate uh, one with the other. Okay, the, the problem, the couple of problems with what you're saying there, Run, we're not, we're not talking about modern society. We're talking about a holy eternal about so you well, has justice changed wait wait a minute let, let me finish bro we're talking about a holy eternal god so when you sin when i sin it's in relation to god so when you're talking about modern society you're talking in relation to modern society we're talking about in relation to god so that's the first thing the second thing is is um, with Aiken and with David, you're talking about there seems to be an inconsistency there. A couple of things. Number one, the issue of repentance. It's very clear in the life of David, for all his hypocrisy, that he did repent. You read Psalm 51, after he slept with Bathsheba, he cries out to God. And in fact, um, um, Prophet Nathan challenged him and said, you're the man, and he actually repented. Now, yeah, but we don't get I to don't hear know Aiken's if, side of the story. No, but that's but that's the point. That's the point is we don't see whether he did or didn't. We, what we see is a swift judgment on him. But what I'm saying is it's very clear, and so you can't argue from silence. But I can argue from something very clear. David clearly repented, and so therefore. There is a difference there between him and Aiken, right? Secondly, secondly about that is is that um, is God's judgment as well. Is that you know sometimes God judges swiftly, and so for example, uh, you know Aiken is taken out and he's he's just swiftly. For David, even though he repents, he doesn't get away with it. Because in the end, Absalom, son, rebels against him, and he, David is kicked out of his own kingdom. He's, he's, you know, and next thing you know, because of this rebellion by Absalom, Absalom ends up getting in a, a battle with David's troops, and Absalom dies. And it says that David goes, Absalom, Absalom, oh my son, Absalom, and his heart's broken. So his his sin with Bathsheba led in the end to his son rebelling against him, and then his son uh, ended up getting killed. So there was a consequences to his sin. So how God how God wants to judge you know some nations he doesn't judge them quickly. He gives them hundreds of years of opportunity to repent. Some nations he comes down swiftly, and then it's up to God. Uh, how he wants to bring that that judgment, and if he wants to give people time, he's a, he, he can give people time. Uh, I think that the is 
it was serious because you know he was deceiving everybody and that was affecting the military cam campaign whereas David in the end allowed himself to be exposed allowed himself to, to bring everything to the open whereas Aiken kept it secret and he was discovered and that affected the military outcome of Israel and it, and it happened in the New Testament where Ananias and Sapphira were also secret um, and, and deceit, deceitful and it says they just drop they just drop dead and, and not, so, so there's something there where God takes it seriously if you're deceiving if you are deceiving in, in, in the house of God and you keep it deceived and it's affecting the house of God that that there can be serious consequences we're not we're not messing around with nuclear bombs here we're not messing around society we're messing around with God and you can't mess with the Holy God yeah. I, I'm kinda of jumping around but it's also interesting to me that like with Ananias and Sapphira uh, he could just drop them dead um, but with all of these nations of people uh, it was necessary to have this mass slaughter where the people of Israel had to go in fight many of them died in the process and uh, and and it just was violent and, and horrific uh, as any battle of that kind would have been because, um, because God God's God's not not limited to me to me I mean he used the flood in the time of Noah he used brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah um, he uses his blessings come in different ways. He allows the sun to come off. He allows to, for you to eat apples, pears, oranges. He allows you to eat. Blessings come in different ways. And judgments come in different ways. God, God's a creative God. He's not limited by one set means of dealing with a nation or an individual. How we, how God will deal with you, is not the same way that He'll deal with me. You might need more patience than than me or he might or God might need more patience with me than you uh, you might be far more intelligent than me and I'm sure you are and so you could grasp uh, biblical truth more quicker than me and so you won't need uh, you know if you became a Christian you wouldn't need wouldn't need chastisement as much as me who would be a slow learner so, so God God works in different ways, uh, well, and he's not limited. Yeah, I mean, but, but there are some ways that are just seem really, really bad. Like, just that no one, no one with uh, with any kind of sense would 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 do things that way. Um, well, the th the thing is, it's it's kind of like a, like a nail, you know. You get a nail, and you get your hammer, and you bang that nail, bang that nail. Eventually the nail goes in, and well, that's what you're doing tonight. I, I don't mean this in a disrespectful way. I believe that you're a very, very sincere person. But there's a nail that you keep banging and banging and banging, and basically what it is is, you know, I I disagree morally speaking the way the Bible is morally, and you keep banging away at that. And I've, what the, what I've tried to do is to at least try to give you different perspectives on exegesis and theology and how you might come at these things but I, I would I would ultimately you know come come down if I was being if I didn't think you were sincere I would cut the ground off you straight away but because I think you're sincere yeah. I would cut your ground from under your feet is I would say to you okay morally speaking you disagree with XYZ in the Bible and I would ask the question is morality objective or subjective and if it's objective, could you tell me how it is objective that you have an objective standard to be able to question the Bible? And that is the way I would cut the ground from under you. I've not done. I've not done that. I've let you keep hammering this one nail because I believe that you're not doing it facetiously. You're doing it out of a genuine feeling that this is the way you are. But that, sure. those are the two questions that if we were in a proper debate that you would have to grapple with an answer and I don't think you find I, find, I think you would find it very hard to answer well but I, I mean are you familiar with Sam Harris yeah uh, I find I find his his account of of morality very persuasive 
that that essentially, you know, morality um, pivots on this idea of of human well-being, um, and that um, you know we uh, we can we can even begin to calculate um, the the benefits or harm to human well-being in much the same way we would. Uh, for human health, I mean, we can say that that human health is has an objective truth to it in some sense, um, but that that some things are are healthy and okay for some people, and and the same kinds of activities and things would be unhealthy for other people. Um, we can say the same for for morality, um, and then we can look at this from a broad lens and say. Uh, you know, society as a whole. What kinds of things can we allow? What kinds of things should we not allow? And and begin to reason and and be be rational about it, and and take an approach of that's that looks at wellness as kind of the the determining factor, um, and say, uh, you know, make make value judgments based on that. Okay. Okay. Um, on this issue of human well-being, I would say that that is a subject. Even though you, you you would argue that we can substantiate that there are certain things that produce well-being, but there'll be m many th things that you might say is well-being. So, for example, for you, it might be well-being not to smoke, but for someone else, it might be well-being. So. What you say, or what a group of people say is scientifically well-being, doesn't necessarily mean for somebody else that it's well-being. So you still, I think, don't get out of the subjective issue. Well, it, 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 just like health, right? I mean, we could say, we can say that you know, for some people, um, eating peanut butter or nuts is is healthy, um, but there are people who will die if they eat peanut butter. Uh, because they have a severe allergy to it. Well, we can say that society can allow the people who can eat peanut butter to eat peanut butter or peanuts, and people who can't shouldn't be forced to, right? And we can allow for both to exist, and that produces a, a society that is um, well with respect to consumption of nuts as a, as a food. Okay, well, well, how does that work with, say, abortion? Uh, abortion is a difficult issue. You have, and, you have a fetus in the womb of a woman, and there's no particular reason why the fetus should be aborted. Only the reason that the woman wants to exercise her right. Right, and and I think how does that work? How does your how does we're, we're getting to the cash value of where the the where where this actually works or not so sure and and I'm I'm happy to to go here because I think it's I think it's a good exercise um so there there are a couple of issues one is the the ideal issue and and ideally yeah I don't think that women should um have abortions just for the sake of convenience uh for the sake of uh, they just don't like it, um, and and in an ideal world where we could make those kinds of determinations and and sift out um, women who are are just doing it because they were negligent and you know when they were having intercourse, um, uh, maybe that would be maybe that would be good uh, to do that. Um, the reality is that. Um, from a legal standpoint and um, you know a, a standpoint of, of our judicial systems and things like that uh, it's very difficult to make those kinds of determinations for one thing um, and then there's an expediency factor because there are only nine months available um, in which those kinds of determinations can be made and and our court systems don't have that kind of um, what's the word um, 
we, we, we don't handle things quickly, unfortunately. Um, and, and just as a pragmatic matter, because there are some circumstances where the vast majority of us would say, okay, this is a situation where maybe the mother's life is at stake, um, and it's a it's a, a very risky pregnancy. Maybe she's got children who are already you know living and depend upon her. Um, if if she and her husband feel that it's in the best interest of the family to abort, we wouldn't say no. You can't do that. Um, okay. You know, but and. And it's difficult for a court system to handle those things uh, in a way that is expedient and um, and and fair. Okay. A um, couple of things there. Um, uh, my main question there was about we're not on about the complications of family. You know, I, I you know the, it was clearly asked about just a woman who. Purely because she feels that she is going to have well-being, and scientifically, she could provide data that women who have had abortions, from her perspective, have well-being. According to your argument, that so long as it's well-being, then it would be okay to abort that that, that fetus. Well, I mean, there, there, are, again, there are. This is a multifaceted issue. Um, you have the well-being of a potential child, uh, and and I don't discount that. Um, I think that that that's a, a factor. And um, uh, as as so, the so, well, so she's decided she's going to have an abortion, and that will make her well, and. Uh, and, and give her well-being, and she's got scientific data to, to prove it. Now, there are tens of thousands of these people who feel the same, and they're able to get political influence, and they're able to get the law to, to back them up. How did your philosophy of well-being accord with that? Well, I mean, if, first of all, we'd have to establish that that was the case, right? I mean, you could say... You could say, well, you know, people might develop science or something that uh, establish rape as as being contributive to well-being, um, and we could be very skeptical about that from the get-go, right? And and say, well, that that doesn't seem to mesh with what we already know about uh, the effects of that. Um, so, uh, but but then too, as I said, um, there is. There's at least another potential life there, um, and it's, uh, I, I think, from a scientific and secular perspective, somewhat difficult to say where life begins exactly, um, but we can say that it's it's somewhere in there, um, and and when you have, uh, a, you know, a, a, a fetus or, uh, you know, a baby that's that's you know developed to the stage of seven, eight, nine months uh, in the womb. Uh, that's you know, and it's it's a viable fetus that can live uh, beyond the the womb. Uh, you you've got a pretty strong case to be made that uh, this is a a, a life. Um, but again, back to just you know pragmatic. Uh, you know the, the the fact that we don't have good ways uh, right now of distinguishing between cases where there is a legitimate concern for the life of the mother or for her own rights. You know, maybe she's been violated in a rape or something like that. Um, our court cases are not nimble enough to deal with those kinds of of distinctions in an expedient time frame that that doesn't push that time limit back and back and back. Um, you know, if you have the beginning of a court case, to, you know, to determine whether or not a woman um, can have a legitimate abortion that, uh, you know, falls within the categories that we think might be permissible uh, versus those that we think are, are morally not permissible, um, by the time a court's uh, sorted through all of that, weeks or months could have passed, and now we have uh, an abortion 
potentially that's more more difficult and uh, and maybe more morally um, reprehensible uh, than the initial. Mm. I mean, I don't. I don't like abortion. I don't. I don't. Nobody. Nobody that I've ever heard of says hooray for abortion. Um, but, but the fact of the matter is, there there are cases where uh, it is certainly. Um, all, uh, all. You know, yeah. uh, Ron, I appreciate your very eloquent. I mean, sincerely, your eloquent uh, discussion there and sharing. Uh, the only thing I was trying to highlight there is. Is you were talk we were talking about objective morality of well-being, and, sure. I, and all I was trying to show is when we talk about objective morality about well-being, that it's you know the, there's going to be competing views of what well-being is and right. how and how it is applied. That's all I'm saying. And like this, you know, and and um, I'm not saying that you, 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 you it's not possible. To get some kind of objective understanding, but I'm just saying it seems to me highly improbable, uh, and I'm just trying to show that there are there are, there will be these competing views about what is well-being and how it's applied. Sure, absolutely, but we can have intelligent conversations about it, and then, and there are going to be definitely some areas that are maybe a little fuzzy because it's difficult. I mean, end of life is another. Uh, another area that becomes a bit fuzzy and, and it's maybe hard to say definitively this is what happens and this is when life ends and this is uh, you know X Y and Z uh, but but we can we can look at the facts and we can try and, and reason through them and we can make the best determination that we can with the information that we have at hand I, I would say that the you know, I'm not saying that scientific knowledge um, uh, is not helpful in helping us to understand what decisions to make, but I would say that uh, you know there are deep philosophical issues about about value. What is value? Why is something value valuable? And how does um, a naturalistic perspective uh, explain value um, and why we value? Some things and some why we value human beings and why we don't value other things and you know so what I'm saying is that uh, you know if we went into those things and that you know it would put a strain um, on your on your position so for example um, you know if we've evolved. Uh, if that's if that's your position that we've evolved, uh, and morality is part of the evolutionary process, at what point in that process can there be an absolute moral standard? Because if you're in a historical flow and a process, there's never going to be a, a point at which you've arrived, or at which you will ever say is that objective standard. I don't think it has to be absolute. I think it has to be objective in some sense. And I, I would I would point to the development of of Western medicine and and uh, medical science as a comparative thing. I mean, we would say that there is an objective truth about whether or not someone is healthy, um, and they can have a medical exam and say, well, by our our best understanding, this is a healthy person. Um, we can say objectively that there are there are situations where human well-being is increased or decreased um, on a you know maybe difficult a more difficult scale to put it on yeah. um, but we can say that it you know uh, Sam Harris says well uh, you know we can say medically health um, does not involve vomiting all the time and we can say that objectively um, you know we can say that that well-being does not include um, being oppressed or having uh, restricted human rights and things. I mean, that's part of, of well-being. Mm. I think, uh, you know, culturally, I mean, you know, what... In terms of the history of culture, 
a variety of cultures. Cultures have different understandings of what well-being is. If you do, if you do uh, sociological research in Japanese and if you do sociological scientific research on the issue of happiness, for example, and you look at what makes a culture happy, what makes Jap the Japanese happy, what makes them feel that they have well-being, is not, say, for example, the same as Western cultures. Right. So, so when you say that you think there is this kind of general standard, if you actually compare... Uh, different cultures, so I, I'd encourage you to go and look at the, whatever the recent research is on scientific research on on happiness and what makes Japanese culture uh, people in Japanese culture feel happy, and and then compare it to say what it means to Western completely different picture of of what how they see. Um, I know that I'm changing terms. But they do dovetail into each other about well-being. Sure, but I don't. I don't think that it's fair to say it's completely different. I mean, there are certain differences that are, are clear um, between cultures. And here's a question, though, Ron. Yeah. Have you ever studied the scientific research on happiness in Japanese culture? I haven't. No. Well, I did a few years ago. I listened to a lecture on it. So I, it, when, when I'm te when I'm saying this, I. I I have some I have some kind of understanding there. That if you actually look at it, the, the, there are there might be some similarities in in certain areas, but then there are big variables on certain things that we think are important. But I mean, it was a couple of years ago since I looked at it. But if you look at it, you it's quite shocking what actually uh, makes Japanese culture uh, tick. Yeah, I, I enjoy I enjoy. I enjoy cultural studies. I can't talk, um, but uh, I, I work for uh, an international uh, development uh, organization that that works with families and communities uh, all around the world uh, f to help them, you know, uh, escape poverty and hunger and things. Um, but uh, part of the job that that I really enjoy is just interacting with. With people from all around the world and things, and and uh, I know there and recognize that there are stark differences um, between cultures. I, I. Uh, Good for you, mate. I'm I'm impressed. Ron, I'm I'm impressed. Well, thank you. <laughs> Listen. I am, I enjoy it. I very much enjoy it. I love going into work every day and and you know being a part of of what we do. Um, but. Okay, um, it, it, it's nearly quarter past one. Oh yeah, so I'm gonna give you the final say. You can have the final say, and I just want to say before you finish that it was an absolute delight to talk to you, sir. You you're a wonderful man, and I've really enjoyed chatting to you, bro. Well, thank you. I've I've enjoyed our our conversation too. I, I wish more people could have uh, just uh, respectful conversations like this. Uh, it's it's excellent. I'll let um, you, you, you say your final bit, and then we'll, we'll call it a day. And if you want to say goodbye to viewers, if you want to uh, point them to your um, blog, and I'm going to read up on your blog. Sure. Yeah, uh, my blog is run, gavagai run at blogspot.com, and it's R-U-N-G-A-V-A-G-A-I. R U N run Gavagai run Gavagai is from a thought experiment a thought experiment by Quine but if you go to my Google Plus page um, you you'll find a link to the to the blog there um, but I, I don't know I don't I mean I I think that just to to wrap up here um, I, I don't think either of us was was persuaded by by the other one tonight, but I, I've I've enjoyed the conversation and and uh, you've given me some things that I want to look into further and um, I I hope that you know I've maybe at least given you some food for thought too. So you have you have run. Uh, thank you, mate, for sharing what you shared and um, yeah, I'll be chewing on some of the things that you've said, mate. So thanks a lot, bro, and thank you for your time. All right. Um, have a good night, Jason. You too, mate. I hope I see you again, bro. Take care. Take care, mate.